Okay, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about single support chain for the Oveka. And so everything original I'm going to say is joint work with uh, Chris Elliott, who is a postdoc at, at IHES. So let's see. Yes, maybe for this audience, I can also talk to the audience from the Netherlands, I guess. Yeah, I wasn't sure about the audience, so, but maybe I can be quick about that part. So let me start with quick introduction to what I'm going to talk about. So, sort of the context of my talk is what is for the domestic Langlands correspondence. And a uh, famous version of that, you know, is an equivalence of two categories. So input data is, let's see, without input G. So like GLN, SLN, and say contact new on surface, or smooth project paper. So these two are our input data. And I'm going to make two categories and then going to assert an equivalence between them. So that's the conjecture. Uh, this is called the best of conjecture in the literature. It says Different categories. So maybe let me read it. Maybe let me, I can even write. So button G is modular of G wonders and flat G is modular space of flat G bundles, G check bundles. Here G check is another reductive group or the Langland zero group. So it's not so important to, to know what, what, what it is. And like uh, in the in the example like G is GLN, this is going to be GLN again and for SLN this is between PGLN. So there is a sort of unique group you can associate to a given reductive group. That's the Langland zero group and somehow the this conjecture is uh, asserting an equivalence between uh, two categories. One, you can, one is in terms of G, the other in terms of G. That's the basic nature of the uh, conjecture. And if you're actually not familiar with this conjecture, that's kind of fine. Like somehow this is only introduction. And yeah, so there, there are a lot of things uh, to explain about this conjecture. But uh, somehow I'm saying that that's not really important to understand that. So let me read it again. For given this uh, modular space of G bundles, you can think of a category of D modules on that. That's the left-hand side. The right-hand side is that on, on this modular space of flat bundles, you can think of a category of coherent sheets. So yeah, that's the basic feature of this conjecture. So let me just add a few more remarks, just in words. Um, yeah, let me. Yeah, maybe it's not really important for this talk, so let me know. Um, when, but the important remark I want to make is the, this conjecture. is wrong so this conjecture is known to be wrong unless the, the given without the group is a straight torus and our infinite and gain story uh, 
So propose a modifying conjecture. And they have a pretty good idea of how to prove that. So for GL2, I think basically everything is known. For GLM, like, I think, yeah, I think people know enough that it's, it's not going to be wrong. For general group G, I think it's uh, pretty open at the moment. So what I'm going to talk about in the second section and third section, if this is as follows, namely in the second section, I'm going to explain uh, kind of this modified conjecture. That's uh, the singular support part in this conjecture. I'm going to explain what I mean by singular supports and try to modify this conjecture in such a way that it has a hope to be proved. And in the third section, I'm going to explain sort of physical origin of uh, these singular supports by introducing this notion of modulo vector. That is going to be the Any question about the introduction? Okay. If not, let me start actual talk. So our implement A3, uh, as I said, proposed a modification of the conjecture. So So when I kind of made this conjecture, I, I wasn't really precise what I really mean by this D and right, what I really mean by this co. And I, I don't want to be like that precise um, because I'm not really going to talk about this demodulus side at all. But let me just say that there is uh, some natural category of demodulus uh, you can consider on the left hand side. And it's co, and for that, like, I'm really thinking of the user. Uh, say DG category coherence on the, on the other side. And for the version, I'm saying that it, it needs modification. So whatever the kind of demodulus you can naively think of on the left hand side, it's not going to be matched up with like any sort of like naive formulation or modification on the right hand side. So you know this sort of best of conjecture was around from 90s and a lot of smart people are thinking about that, but still they couldn't really get this conjecture right until I think and case where you kind of figured it out from, like around 2000. 10, I think, 11, something like that. Five. Huh? Five. Really? They already had an idea around that? I think so. Huh. But then like the writing up takes like six yeah, years. Yeah, Yeah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So let me explain more about that. So even in 90s, uh, people knew that the uh, problem with this conjecture it has to do with uh, similarity of uh, this space. So maybe from now on, let me change notation, uh, sort of exchange notation G and G check because I'm going to focus more on the, this coherent shape sign. I'm going to write flat G as opposed to flat G check. <coughs> so even in 90s, people knew that uh, you, you need to do something about singularity of this flat G. So for, say, irreducible flat uh, connections, Okay, everything was fine, and you can really find an object corresponding on the left hand side and are good. But to actually have a category equivalence as opposed to you know just kind of natural bijection, uh, you, you'd want to have you, you need to do something about that, that people do. So I think even in even when this conjecture is formulated, people knew that literally this isn't going to be working. And what is the problem? So as written, one thing I can say is that, let me also omit the notation from notation C, because it's fixed. If 
people knew that actually, as, as written, uh, the right hand side is bigger than the left hand side. I mean, one could exhibit some object which is belonging to one, but there is no corresponding object on the other side. So, then of course, the natural idea is I try to find either enlargement of the left hand side, or sort of the, you, you want to cut down the right hand side category of B to be sort of matched with the left hand side. That's an idea. And in algebraic geometry, I mean, this is not, not for algebraic geometry, but in, in algebraic geometry, um, you certainly have some natural uh, candidates for, for doing that. Namely, when you're, say, it's a virtual variety of scheme, you have other categories of measure, namely, perfect complex. And perfect complex is uh, is coherent complex, coherent sheet. By the way, in case it wasn't clear, everything is derived. So when I write a category, it always means a DG category. So perf is a DG category of perfect complexes, and this is kind of so DG category of coherent shapes. <laughs> right, and if x is not smooth, then Co is strictly bigger than perf. It's basically, it's actually if and only. So let me maybe give an example of an object living in co but not living in perf, just to give us a sense of uh, what kind of thing I am talking about. Okay. So maybe let's let's let a to be uh, the real number and x is step a. This is also meant to be an illustration of what I mean by perf and co, because maybe not everyone is kind of familiar with this terminology. So what I'm thinking of here is that if I think of k as an a mod, claim is that this is coherent, but not perfect. So if you know sort of the usual coherent, what, what I mean by coherent, this is clear. And but the claim is that it is not perfect. So when people say perfect, they, they mean that it's a finitely generated by uh, vector bundles or projective modules. So in this case, if you try to find a resolution of k by projective resolution, maybe you would end up with perfect complex is supposed to be finitely generated. So you probably see that in what sense this is not perfect. You cannot write down finite resolution of this uh, module using just perfect complexes, like projective modules over uh, this algebra. So right, this x given by your number is written as smooth, and uh, whenever this is not smooth, you are going to see that but the complex is strictly smaller than coherent sheets. That's what I'm trying to convey with this example. Okay. So far so good. So then, of course, the next trier is. 
try to compare these two. But again, it turns out that life is not so easy, and this time it's strictly bigger on the left hand side. So, of course, the aim should be that try to find something here, which is sitting inside of code, but containing perk. Give a situation. That's the natural aim. Right? And that's exactly what I think is for you kind of the uh, it's not just for this uh, language correspondence. They have developed some framework to do to find something in between whenever this uh, the space to be here is nice enough. And when I say nice enough, it has some technical term. It's called quite smooth. So let me explain that. Which is this uh, commutative differential rate algebra? So, 
uh, it has some non-zero homological E, but that's fine. And just to give an idea of uh, this equivalence, we can also see that the Pazian complex of this space is kind of scale, basic scale, right? You know, if you have polynomial mean, you, you certainly expect to see following in this. And you can see that this is this should be of degree one. And that's that's what I mean by amplitude is V1. And you could have some sort of non-direct direction as well. But I just wanted to convey sort of the main uh, main part for these quality movements. And, and this you have is the essential one for that. Okay. So far so good. Is there really no question? It's kind of hard to believe that I'm not getting any question for. Hard to believe that people are like following everything. Huh? It's okay? Okay. Hmm. Okay. So, what am I talking about now? I observed that whatever the category we are aiming to get here should be smaller than this and bigger than that. And I just introduced some. Term. An objective on, on the what kind of space I can put in, put in here uh, to to explain the framework of arithmetic gauge grid to this kind of pop down procedure. But how can one actually cut down a given value uh, to get an idea? Maybe let's borrow some ideas from the presentation here. I mean. So let's maybe start with a simple G algebra. And representation theory of this G is equivalent to modular theory of its universal developing algebra. Basically by definition, I guess. And you know, in representation theory, certainly you, you are interested in this category. But here, like, you, you have some natural way to cut down the category, which is kind of maybe if you want two step process or three step, depending on how you count. First of all, uh, consider the center. And if you are careful, you do realize that actually this idea works for arbitrary associative algebra. Then consider spectrum of the center. By construction, center is connected to algebra, so you can take center spectrum, which is joint to space. And, and the idea is, of course, if I think of is a picture of Ujima. This entire board is a sort of the supposedly explained of uh, Ujima. And I'm thinking of this picture of, think, I'm thinking of this Ujima as living over the stack of central Uji. And typical name for an element here is maybe com. So what am I doing here? I am interested in this category. But somehow I just using this kind of center construction, I decompose this complicated category into very simple algebra geometry of stack of center 
which is actually you know just a cartagma W. So upon space of rank R for R where where R is the rank of the simple algebra. And kind of fiber-wise representation view. And you know, fiber-wise, you can use a lot of technique like Daniels and Bernstein representation. So it's a good, good way to try to understand uh, this huge amount. And, and as I said, this idea works for arbitrary associated algebra. The claim is that I, I want to do something similar uh, for our category. So why don't I maybe record uh, what I'm saying here as a table? So G simple energy problem. And I, I want to fill out uh, what's going to happen for quasi smooth scheme on the right hand side. So here, you know, first of all, I, I want to note that this works for arbitrary algebra. A mod, which in our case is G mod. And the next step is considering the center of A, in our case. Z, and the next step was thinking of this spec of center, which is just a H mod W, which is Cartan and W is Y algebra. And then, you know, a given element chi, I kind of successfully decompose the category using this chi. I just decided to look at only the ones supported on this kind, which is kind of pretty well-known idea of representation theory. So what do I want to do here? Certainly, in this generality, as I said, I, I want to think of sort of coherence. This sort of argument works in some, to some, I mean, to some extent, even for arbitrary BG category. So, essentially, this is BG cap. So, the first question one should ask is what is the center of given category? What is the center of the coherent sheets on quite a uh, scheme? I'm saying that the notion of center makes sense for arbitrary BG category. I'm not going to use anything about this. Yeah. Just like I can make sense of center of the any given algebra. And if you think about uh, that leads to the definition of popular coaching. So Concretely, what, what am I saying? An object here is uh, maybe a collection, kind of roughly, just to give an idea. For any objects, I'm, I'm giving uh, such a map. It's an endomorphism of identity. And, and in, in such a way that, you know, of course I, I could make sense of this for f, f1 and as we can just find but Of course I, I want to assign these kind of the a and f's in such a way that the, whenever I have more vision, it's going to be commuting. That's what I mean by the, if you think about what, what it means, that's, that's, that's the case. And also, if you know sort of the, this DG category, how, how it works, 
it's kind of clear that actually this is kind of the DG object. You have sort of naturally induced uh, differential. Oh, I didn't mean to erase this. Sorry. Step. following this procedure, you'd end up with extra center as we need. So this is a generalization working for a category. Note that the category itself doesn't need to be realized as a modular category of some algebra. The definition just, just works. I'm saying that in that case, it covers the previous case. So nice generalization. And, and it's kind of a really good exercise that in how, why you, you, you need to you only see center as opposed to entire algebra. Library, you might think that any object of your given algebra is going to give multiplication by that element for each module. But if you want to really find a commuting diagram, you certainly end up requiring uh, commutativity of <coughs> algebra. Okay. Still fine? Cannot believe it. Yeah. Okay, so. And in, in this case, you actually write Hoxer co cochains or Hoxer co of X. Okay, the next step is maybe try to find analog of stack of the center. And this is where like, I, I, I would need quasi smooth assumption. So, so far, I didn't use anything. You know, it was for arbitrary C. But maybe how should code change or how should homology is like not that geometry. I, cannot, I don't want to sort of draw a picture of spec of this sort of thing. And but once you have this quasi smooth assumption, you can you can kind of make it better. That's maybe one way to exactly what I can engage with. You. So what am I saying? So first of all, where, where are we heading? We want to find some geometric space over which I, I want to draw this location. So I want to find some geometric space. Uh, having to do with function coaching, so cohomology. And for that, uh, there is a very famous theorem for HKR. Structure cohomology 
is going to define this way. Is isomorphic to the global sections of I mean, polyvector fields. Um, but I, I want to sort of talk about some generalization of this theorem. So maybe fat. When x is a uh, fine direct in say, I mean, you, you need some more technical assumption like eventually co-connective or something like that, but let me not say more like that. And turns out that you, you, you have. such an equivalence. So it's not really important to understand this fact, so I, I, I'll be rather brief in explaining. So left hand side, I just wrote down the Hochschild coachings, and right hand side, I, I did write down gamma x and u of this tangent wonder shifting. That's what I wrote down. What's the theta here? So oh, you know, all, all the x. So universal um, involving algebra. Yes, over yeah. Okay. Cool. So scalar by of course OX. So living on the OX matrix. Thanks for the first question. <laughs> I'm looking for a second question as well. Okay. So is you as and it's kind of the corrective thing now. It's a universal developing algebra of some sort. Algebra construction, or function, if you want. Which means that whatever this is, this should be some kind of real algebra of okay? And I'm not really going to explain more, more about uh, this claim, but it's kind of true claim, is whenever you have x, actually in like really big generality, this what is called shifted tangent complex has the algebra structure. Uh, so you can try to make sense of universal developing algebra. So formally, I uh, hope just kind of makes sense. And I'm just going to use these to go, go further. So let's see. First of all, just as a setting check, when x is smooth outline, uh, let's see if I recover the left hand side. So when x is smooth outline, that means that this density tx is the usual tx. That's you know, since definition of smooth, being smooth. And I, and I end up with u of tx minus 1. But for a degree reason, tx minus 1 is trivial algebra. In that case, u, as you know, is the symmetric algebra. And one can take definition of exterior algebra to be symmetric algebra with that shift. So it's reasonable claim in this case. But the situation I, I kind of want to apply is, of course, uh, when x is uh, quite smooth. So in that case, Px has, say, degree in 0 and 1. So, in particular, we have better control than arbitrary case. And what do I want to observe here? Um, I, I want to just observe that I have this map from degree 0 part, part of degree 0 to degree 0. I have such a map. So, algebra map. And I also have degree 2, x, tx minus 1 to h, h, 2 of x as a measure over the above 
algebra. There is some small, huh? I'm just trying to. There is some small mismatch in the in the fact uh, in the you know in the usual Lie algebra in the asymptotic story. The center is the gene variance in the asymptotic algebra. So you would expect that the right hand side here would be the gene variance in the the, the Tx minus one invariance in the neurosynthetic algebra. So there has to be some explanation that says that passage to global sections actually automatically gives you invariance. Is that clear? I didn't even get your first part, but you know, if you just have a layout, yeah. you look at the universal algebra. Right. The center of the universal algebra algebra by Costner's theorem right. is the gene variance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Universal yeah, yeah, yeah. algebra, which is the same as the gene variance in the symmetric algebra. Right. Right. So. Oh, I see. I see. In the same way, you know, as the Costner Rosenberg theorem tells you that the gene variance in the symmetric algebra of the shifted tangent bundle are the same as it's just a symmetric algebra, right? Right. Trivial reasons. Uh, and these are the global sections. There, there should be something analogous here. That yeah, yeah, that, that's right. So I think what you are saying is I think I think when you take Jerry's cohomology, you, you you impose that. Yeah, so yes. so so some colleagues should say that yeah, right. passage of cohomology automatically that, that, that's, right. That's, that's right. I'm not explaining that, but I think that's true. <coughs> okay. Because you could have you could have formulated the theorem by not passing the homology, yes, but yes, saying yes, let's yes. pass the invariance. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I, I don't really have as much time. I realize now, like, it's only for an hour, right? Yeah. I didn't even start like my my part. It's uh, yeah. service to Arvind and Gaspar, yeah. and I can explain it better than they do. Oh, I this I didn't. I wasn't mean to be saying that in front of video, but. I think. I think I'm. I think. Yeah. Maybe no more comments. Uh, <laughs> okay. Right. So, so I, I was just observing that uh, given that, uh, and under quasi smooth assumption, quasi smooth is kind of used like, to make sense of the. This cohomology is going to be very defined as a map back to this other thing or something. And, and I'm just saying that uh, Jerf cohomology part here is going to be giving Jerf cohomology here. The degree two part is giving degree two part here. That's all I'm saying. So maybe let me observe that you could have written uh, in this way.
And once you have that, same idea works. Mainly by thinking of some, in this case, you do some sort of a point and then think of the things supported there. But by thinking of the things supported on subset, they can. I'm sorry. What do you mean by classical part? So maybe just think of the A0 of OX, A0 of TX1. Okay. So, let's see. Right, so, definition. If you have a subset of this thing X, what can make sense of coherent sheaves supported on Z in this sense. So mainly this is defined as uh, you know, sheaves, but with respect to this map, which you always have, so support of F is uh, in F, in, in Z, given Z. I mean, of course, you could, I mean, this Z is always kind of conical, so it's closed, and, as a, as a definition, I think it makes sense. Really in the same way. So sort of set theoretically supported. Um, so let me maybe say just a few more words about the work of Arnik and Gaisley, how, how they kind of formulated their conjecture. Um, and I'm saying that in this case, I, I can just make sense of uh, this for whenever you have a subset. But let me just see how they use this uh, to join Lama's correspondence, and then let me kind of Sure. Question. So in uh, the singular support, sorry, in the, uh, uh, in the character story before, mm -hmm. it, it was really interesting to work with like formal characters and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, like a formal neighborhood of a character. Right. But the thing only depend on like the underlying, like it, does it can see the scheme theoretic structure of C sitting inside of C. Mm -hmm. Actually, people only do it for reduced things. So, I'm saying that the set theory for support is sort of the right intuition. Kind of, I mean, in a sense, I'm kind of the. Maybe that's not exactly the right thing to say, but uh, physically, I, I, I think, I mean, I have arguments that like, set theory for support is kind of seeing more structures, and I think that's kind of more. How can I say? Maybe I can explain more like, once I kind of get to my theory. And also, it's kind of true that if you just kind of think of skin theoretic support, the theory is not, not rich enough. It's a kind of not, not an argument, but. Okay, let me just kind of briefly say like what I guess we did. So for them, this X, the quite smooth, is this flat G. But uh, because I, I don't want to spend like, too much time on this, let me cheat a bit and maybe think of a case of modulus of local systems, which is analytically equivalent, but like, not algebraically. So, but this kind of uh, is a simpler description. If I like mention, uh, it's going to be like that. So in particular, if I think of this, uh, um, it does have really simple description, which makes this uh, log G tilde manifestly uh, sort of quasi smooth. You know, it has like the two G generators, and then it's going to be having one relation in my computer being one. So that's how, how you realize that. And if you think through, let me maybe brief here. 
and, but you're welcome to ask me more afterwards. Uh, this scheme of singularity here is essentially flat connection. In this case, maybe local system. Together with a section of the G mod G. That's the scheme of singularity for this particular X. And I'm saying that uh, for them, by choosing things with sigma, the section being actually uh, lying inside the middle bottom cone of this G mod G, uh, you can make sense of uh, the right hand side category, which by definition sitting in between co, co and perf, and that's the proposal. So they develop summarize, they develop general framework for quite smooth objects, and then uh, by picking this particular thing, uh, they, and then they can prove a lot of things, and it, it has a lot of tests. That looks like for GLN is true. I don't know how, how many more minutes I can, I can take. I, I think I started a bit late, but can I take, I don't know, 12 more, more minutes? Yes. OK. Thanks. So OK. So the third section is digital original. Maybe I, I want to say a few words about how I sort of get into this uh, thing. So the first time I heard about this uh, IRKG3 formulation is when I was a first year graduate student and in, in Germany, and Tony was giving a lecture series on this topic. So that's how, how I learned about this topic. And I mean, of course, I, I was like first year, so I didn't really understand many things. But uh, he, he mentioned one remark which kind of distracted me for, for the entire week, which shows that uh, somehow from the topological point of view, point of view you only get to see this uh, modular space for local systems, uh, not, not the modular space for black connections. And as I kind of saying, they are arbitrarily quite different. Of course, this doesn't depend on C, and this does. And also, when he explained that, actually, this knows everything about given curve. So it's a huge difference if you care about arbitrary geometry. And then I thought, you know, if, if you know, Kakushin and Nikun can get us as close as like what they figured out, like that there must be something in, in this quantum field theory. You know, I, I was a believer, and you know, I am still a believer in quantum field theory ideas. So I thought that like, there must be some way to encode uh, this algebraic information. I mean, it, it, it is just not known because the way PCs think about it's just maybe not, their frameworks may be not uh, necessarily for algebraic geometry. And since then, you know, I was trying to understand uh, sort of this kind of physics of this couple of written. And actually, two and a half years ago, I came here and did the first talk, and there I can explain how, how to think of. Uh, this flat G from the physics side, and then sort of the result was that somehow from the physical point of view, if you do it uh, in some way, uh, this object is appearing in a more natural way. Essentially, because you, you see some what is called the holomorphic twist, uh, which is corresponding to what's usually called the classical limit of the Lama transpondence that you know Tony is on, uh, and you know. Even Higgs moduli, the fact that things are realized as a twist or deformation of that is kind of proving that actually it should be flat sheet as opposed to local sheet. So that was kind of the one main argument. <coughs> and now um, I am going to explain that the singular support condition is also kind of can be explained in terms of features. So yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. 
So I, I'm just saying that it's, uh, it's a great pleasure of mine to explain this in front of Tony. Like, uh, I, I kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm basically saying that I now understand what Tony was saying in my own way. That's a uh, one sentence summary of this talk. Okay. So, let's see. There are a few things to say. Um, right, so I said this is uh, about modular space of nature. So I need to get there. So what is this vector? So a vector is a short for vacuum state, and a state in physics is a map from observable to a number. Whatever it is, it is kind of the pairing with an observer to give us a number. Linear map. And in topological theory, um, it turns out that a vacuum state, I mean, in general, like what is called a vacuum state is a state satisfying some what is called Cluster decomposition property, but in cluster theory, it turns out that uh, vacuum state is just a ring as opposed to uh, just a linear homomorphism here, which which is suggesting that maybe uh, this modulus of vacua is defined as spec or I'm kind of intentionally being vague because of, I'm, I'm out of time, but if you know what's going on, like in topological theory, say n dimensional theory, these observers are going to be like EN algebra, and kind of in principle, you are thinking of the spectrum in the EN algebra sense, but in practice, in, in our case as well, this EN algebra structure com is coming from commutative algebra, so I can take it to spend the user sense. So it is a algebra. So the claim is that. Um, because this kind of local observer is sort of the universal object, uh, in field in, in theory, it's actually acting on every, everywhere. So plane, uh, given a field theory, whenever you have an object of uh, boundary condition, in our case, an object of uh, this flat sheet, you actually have an edge. Maybe I can kind of skip a, a, a word, which is that uh, from, from this physical point of view, this coherence on flat sheet is a category of boundary conditions. Theory after I define um, C. And it is because that in my first paper, which I kind of explained about you know, two and a half years ago, which I don't expect anyone to remember, I kind of said that uh, I realized that. In this particular case, I'm actually getting the B model with target meaningful display flat G. So if you believe, uh, say, Konsevich, which you should, um, then you're actually getting the category bound position to be this coherence category. But I'm saying that uh, because essentially because your target manifold is kind of hard to spec, uh, you actually have more place to, uh, I mean, so somehow more structure. And by this claim, I'm just saying that this observer, local observer, is acting on boundary condition. You know, so bring it from there. So, what am I saying? I'm, I'm saying that this op, 
or we is playing the role of this thing X. But one claim I'm making is that um, this is kind of the simpler because uh, because this is kind of four, four dimensional point of view, whereas the are engaged with the formulation is kind of two dimensional point, point of view. So maybe let me state from PR first and then um, say, say a few more words. So Consider 4D B twist with engaged loop G. The claim is that uh, this modulus of the vacua is H mod W. And well, of course, you know, for any given point, I can try to make sense of
So, you know, the entire pool and maybe the bottom pool. So both of them were known to Arikan and Ace Green, and uh, Arikan informed me that their unpublished work actually pro proved this research. And for arbitrary group G, um, actually with Arikan and Ace Green, we, we met together like, this January, and we, we got convinced that the conjecture is true. We didn't write down proof, but we kind of discussed enough to convince ourselves. So all three of us are happy. Then what check this. And it's kind of, it's, yeah. If you pass a lot of non-trivial tests, must be true. OK, so let me say a, just a bit about why, why this conjecture is interesting. So first of all, like what I think surprised Arikin and Gaspery, uh, this conjecture does it, is it is saying that you know, I have this uh, the same picture of H mod W, and I'm saying that I'm seeing some, some kind of flat family of uh, Jimmy Langland's correspondence of different groups. I don't think this was known. And what's more, um, if you Exactly. But still, like it's a yeah. It wasn't low. So whenever you can write down your set as Eastern Union of a spin, you you have this kind of factorization property. The conjecture you can easily see that, and which is saying it kind of implying that there is a there must be some some way to encode uh, how, how different Jung Langland is kind of I don't know interact in some way. What what are you writing below the your on the right hand side? There's the coherent x to on. x one to the xm xm plus one to the xm okay. sort of decomposition. Okay, let, let me stop here. Sorry for going over time. Thank you. So, it is surprising, right? Because, um, as you said, in terms of the uh, DG categories, it's a flat state. Yes. On the other hand, the groups are jumping around because yes. these are levy forms for, yes. the, for the centralized. Yes. So it's like Dennis certainly didn't believe it when I first heard him. It took like six months. I mean, I, I met him like six times, and from then on, I think he was convinced. If I ask a question in sure. another direction. Um, so here, in sort of the, your Talk two and a half years ago, I guess, you would, you'd have had some equivalents, and now you're showing that on one side of the equivalents, when we consider the moduli of vacua and we localize single bit supported at a given vacuum, mm -hmm. then we get the singular support condition. Mm -hmm. What's the analog of this on the other side? That's a very good question. Um, I, I certainly have. Sort of Answer to that question, but like not you know sort of honest way. In that, for some like uh, technically the other side is kind of pretty difficult, and I really don't know how to say this. But and also that I don't really have good physical understanding of these uh, technical subtleties. You know, it's, uh, a lot of things are really about uh, what is called the categorical function functional analysis, the difference between coherent shifts and perfect complex, and the between this sort of thing was like never, sort of, never a thing for bitches, and I'm sort of the one who, who is maybe thinking about these sorts of things. And there are just so many things that made me think about, and I, I didn't really understand this a, sort of a side of the story that well. But having said that, I can certainly say that um, 
on the A side, certainly you can think of what is called the renormalized D modules, and that's like what's corresponding to the coherence here, or int co, if I may be more honest. Um, and certainly there you also see the modular space of vacuum to be H bar W. Mm -hmm. um, that there, the origin of it is H bar W just turns out to be co-merge of the E G. Um, then, by thinking of the same procedure, uh, singular supported at zero is recovering the usual D modules. So, at least at the level of zero. Ha have you sort of proved this? No, I mean, that, that was uh, kind of worked out by Arrington A squared. Okay. We observed that uh, that's recovering that, mm -hmm. uh, compared with what we are doing. Yeah. So, we didn't do any work for, for that part. Which okay. is so Assuming that the functional analysis are kind of as expected, uh, what they so worked out is kind of. Assuming they what? Huh? What you mentioned there was an assumption and uh, what was the assumption? Uh, uh, assumption is that the functional analysis, like what's corresponding to int code, mm -hmm. should be this uh, what is for the renormalized D modules. Yep. That wasn't that isn't clear and I don't know how to and argue that, that for, like, from physics because yeah. I don't physics never cared and I <laughs> but it's clear from the from the from the point of view, right? But, that's right, but somehow we're so from the physical point of view, this eigentension is, is not now clear, so I don't know what to say. Really? Yeah. Do, do you have understanding of eigentensions? Why isn't it just... Uh, because it's just a system of... Uh, uh, a system of topological field theories for different groups of parabolic induction. It's just a map. Uh, but that's like not... To not get the domain wall. Uh, well, uh, that, 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 that interface is not as theory to itself, so it's a little confusing. I mean, you're assuming right side says it's kind of the, you can do the same thing on the A side and B side, it's kind of compatible. But that interface, I don't think, is as dirty as side. So, what do we mean? Um, I mean, I wasn't sure if the domain wall had between L and G had been sort of defined in this framework. That, that, that is kind of fine, but I think the more important is that dirty is not really. That the interface is not really preserved by S. No, I, I see what you're saying. So, so it is a domain wall. And then the question is first of all, why is the topological twist compatible with domain walls? And secondly, why is S duality interacting with domain walls as we predict? Right. And that, that's the. That's, that's right. And for the, I think for the first, it's kind of fine. But for the latter, I don't think that's a true thing. So something is confusing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so there are a lot of issues here. Oh, maybe you mentioned this identity in your talk. So maybe still I, I don't understand your talk fully. Next time. Okay. Well, thanks, Phil.